A great conversation tonight from a local journalist that we missed, big time author. The Dan York State of Mind program is brought to you at part by Lookout Rhode Island and Taco Comfort Solutions. Mike Stanton is a guy that uh, no doubt the community misses on uh, the journalistic beat. You know, if you ever want to wonder what the impact is of a journalist, just wait till they leave. And uh, I think that's true for a handful that have left the Providence Journal over the course of time by the natural flow of their careers and the unnatural flow of the economy, you know. Uh, but, uh, you know, Mike has uh, left a signature on, on a lot of things, including, you'll remember, The Prince of Providence, a book that uh, had Buddy Cianci completely unnerved during its uh, production. We have a picture of that, don't we? Yep. Uh, and, uh, uh, you know, it, it's interesting. It seems that there's always some kind of, I don't know, criminal interest or corruption interest that, that Mike has. He's got a nose for it in his new book called Unbeaten. Uh, Rocky Marciano's fight for protection in a crooked world is his latest project. And on Friday evenings, you know, we like to spread it out a little bit. So if you're seeing this originally on Friday evening. You may see this program once or twice over the course of the summer because of its, uh, I'm sure, profound <laughs> um, delivery to the audience. Welcome. Nice to see you, man. Great to be here. Uh, you, you, you like to write about the human condition. The you, human condition. You do. I mean, yeah. you, you, you you dig through it. You're, you're, you're a student of it in a lot of ways, I think. I am. And Providence has been my classroom for right. three decades. And I never left. I left the journal, but I still live in Cranston. Okay. I commute to Yukon where I teach. Right. And uh, I spent the last four years of my life working on this book about uh, Rocky Marciano. Tell me, uh, tell me, before we get into the book itself, uh, tell me about your... Uh, your experience since Prince of Providence and, and, and the impact that that had. I mean, what, what, what do you think now, years later? Um, is it still selling? Are people still yeah, buying it? Yeah, it is. It really? is. It, it's become kind of a, a potluck <coughs> gift for people who move to Rhode Island. Um, I hear lots of stories. People give it to um, someone who moves here to give them a taste of what they're getting in for. And, you know, it gives you kind of a sense of the history and the culture. And, you know, I have always felt that all history is biography. And I thought that Providence was always a fascinating place, and you just needed that one character to really tell the story. Mm. And then Providence, to me, was a microcosm of America because it had that whole early colonial, you know, debate about religious freedom and the role of individuality versus, you know, the shared community that Roger Williams talked about. And, and then, of course, it was the center of the Industrial Revolution and this, this wave of immigration that transformed the country in the 19th century, and Buddy Cianci's parents were part of that wave, as were Rocky Marciano's parents. And they were both, you know, larger-than-life Italian-American figures. Um, they both existed in a world of corruption. Um, obviously, different outcomes, different uh, personalities. Um, but they both uh, had provenance in common. And then when I was researching Buddy's story, I found that his father used to take him as a boy to the Rhode Island Auditorium to watch Rocky fight. Really? Yeah. Is that is that part of your inspiration? It was, because when I was researching the history of Providence, um, for the Prince of Providence, I never expected to go as far back as I went and focus as much as I did on those early years. But they were so fascinating to me, you know, how the city was changing after World War II, and it was kind of becoming a wide-open mob town. The, the factory jobs were starting to leak south. And um, it was just an interesting culture. I you know, hear these stories about the fight night at the Rhode Island Auditorium, you'd have the mobsters and you'd have the cops and the judges and the politicians and the working class people there and the smoky arena. And uh, so it was just a fascinating It's story. all true. It's, it, it, it's, it's what it was. Yeah, I mean, the movies it portray it. Um, I mean, if you're a younger person now and you look back at movies like that, you think, ah, it couldn't have been like that. But yeah. it was like that. I'm old enough to remember Smokefield Arenas. Um, mm -hmm. even, even you go to a basketball game and, and, and the top of the Madison Square Garden or the Boston Garden, as it may be, you know, it was there was a layer up there. You know, it was <laughs> I mean, it just the, the where we've come in terms of just recognition of those small things. We're starting yeah. so small, right, for our health. Yeah. Um, but going back to the Prince of Providence, and and then we'll dig into uh, this new book called Unbeaten. Um, you know, when when the whole Plunderdome trial was going on, and 
you know, I was there every day. You were there more than every day. I want to say more than every day. You were working in it from all sides. And you, you had an ongoing uh, rivalry, really, in a sense, with, with Buddy Cianci. You were, you were on his mind uh, continually. And then when the book came out, it seems to me when you, when, when you, when you become an author mm. on the subject matter, all of a sudden it elevates your persona and your game um, to t kind of another level. Did, did, and I think he felt that. It was almost as if he'd say that it was all malarkey, everything that you wrote, right? <laughs> he did. But, but it was almost, in some ways, kind of checkmate. Did, did you write it in, 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 in a sense uh, about this? Because you guys had, a, you had some relationship. He would seek you yeah. out. He would pick on you it in was... press conferences. He would, he would try to, you know, he would try to, because you were the guy. And he yeah. was trying to get to you all the time. Well, he was upset that when he found out I was writing the book because he always wanted to write his own book, which he eventually did. And he used to is that say, when, "Is that when the friction began? He learned you were writing the book." Yeah, that came first. Yeah, what happened was um, the deal was announced, and it was announced right in the midst of. Well, actually, he knew I was writing the book, and then um, the movie rights got optioned, and that was announced during the lead up to his trial, and that kind of set him off. Um, because he always thought it was his story, and I said it was history. Mm. And so, but you know, a lot of people won't maybe uh, believe this, Dan, but Buddy and I had great conversations. I loved talking to him. And there was that kind of friction that you would have with any journalist and politician, magnified by the fact that I was covering him for the journal, that he was under indictment, that I was writing a book about him. Um, but we had great conversations together. And uh, it was only well, after the book came out. he was as complicated in, relation, oh, yeah. in relationship oh, yeah. as he was in politics in general, right? Because yeah. um, he would tear you a new lung somewhere and, 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 and drink to 2 a.m. In the, in, the, in the bar with you. It, it, it right. was that kind of thing. And I had both ends of that spectrum with him. I bet. Um, you, but, hey, but you'd after, have to, to get the right perspective. But see, the, then, then what happens is he goes away to prison. The book comes out. He's in prison when it comes out. I know he read it in the prison library. Um, and then when he comes back, he's on the talk radio. He's not in City Hall. I'm not covering him. So we never really had many dealings after, afterwards. Hmm. What did you think uh, when he passed? I had suggested that if he won the mayoralty, he'd still be here. But when he lost it, I, I just, I, I just had, a, I had a sinking feeling that well, this you know, wasn't going to go very far. Buddy always seemed immortal, but you knew that that cancer was eating away at him. And even Buddy's not going to beat cancer. And I, I don't know, I'm not a psychoanalyst, but I always felt that he wanted his legacy to end on an up note, that he wanted to end in City Hall. Yeah. And, you know, there was talk about um, one of his former aides told him of a former 19th century mayor who died in office and laid in state at City Hall, and he was very fascinated by that idea. So well, at least then, he got half the deal. And then he got to lay in state at yeah. City Hall. Yeah. When we yeah. come back, we'll talk about the new book. And uh, then we'll get Mike's take on the dynamics of Washington, the media, fake news, the attacks, all that. Stay with us. Now, who is this uh, with the rock? This is, <laughs> this is a, a former superintendent of the state police, if I'm not mistaken. That's Rocky with Colonel Stone. And breaking them up in the middle is the uh, legendary Providence boxing referee, Sharky uh, Bonanno. And Sharky Bonanno's son, also named Sharky, who worked for the city of Providence, uh, shared this photo with me and talked to me about his father. You know, Providence in the f late 1940s and early 50s, after World War II, was a great fight town. And, you know, everybody went to the fights. And there were two headliners. There was Rocky Marciano, the, the Brockton blockbuster from Brockton, Massachusetts, about 30 miles away. And, you know, all the Italian-Americans loved him. And all the fans loved him because he had a great knockout punch, and that was exciting. And then there was the, uh, you know, the Cape Verdean, uh, Giorgio Rujo from Fox Point was starting out. And so the two of them really brought excitement back to uh, the house of action, they called it. Ethnicity is, 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 um, is something that you, you like to write about. Yeah. Uh, and again, studying the human condition. What is it about ethnicity that you find so intriguing in, in a story? Well, it's... Different people come, it's the American story. I mean, people have been coming here since Roger Williams, and they're trying to assimilate and adapt and, you know, escape another world or another life that wasn't so easy. And, you know, they usually arrive here at the bottom of the ladder, and they're trying to climb their way up. 
And when you look at Rocky's story and boxing, how huge it was in the you know, first half of the 20th century, it really is an immigrant story because ethnicity is like the subtext of all these matches. You know, first you have the great Jewish fighters in the early 1900s, then you have the wave of Irish fighters and then Italians and then blacks mixed in and they're all striving and, and, and a lot of ethnicity, it's not just the fighters in the ring because let's face it, only a fraction of them are going to succeed and a lot of them are going to get abused and, and you know, lose their money and lose their brains in some cases. But it's the fans. It's, you know, they go there to identify with an individual and at a time of increasing industrialization and you know, impersonalization in the city. So you're a boxing fan to, to write this or what brought you? To, well, to it was write all this of book. those things. Also, if you look at boxing, it's a really interesting mirror because you have two men in a ring. It's the most fundamental sport that you can imagine, and you know, trying to beat each other's brains in basically to survive. And by the rule, you know, by the this, rule, this, this, this yeah. new, this new stuff that you see at night with the, you know, the on the what is it? It's well, the, the mixed martial the, the arts mixed, and the kick that, boxing. And and and, and uh, what's the what's it called? The the what? No, no, no. That's that's the wrestling part. I mean, that's that's fake, Lexi. That, that's all fake. <laughs> no, but the um, well, now they just beat the living tar out of each other with hardly any rules and, yeah. uh, and no gloves. And, right. Um, what's the name of the, what's the name of that? Um, what, uh, yeah, UFC. What's but what, what's the name of the? Well, anyway, the MMA, the mixed martial arts. Is, okay, whatever. The, the whole thing is just. I mean, I was always a big boxing fan as a young kid, mm -hmm. but this stuff makes my blood curdle. Yeah. The the new stuff. Well, the other thing I think about boxing, you know, in the earlier age, is that these characters were larger than life personas. And if you're the heavyweight champion of the world, you're one of the most known people uh, anywhere, in any walk of life, not just boxing. Yeah. You know, I mean, Rocky was friends with Sinatra, Jerry Lewis, Joe DiMaggio, Ted Williams. You know, everybody knew who he was. Did they make the kind of money prorated? that they do now. It seems like they make more money now, have less notoriety. Yeah. Back then yeah. they were they were the kings of the world. They really. were the kings of the world. But they were they were struggling. No, they didn't make as much money. I mean Rocky's largest purse was under half a million dollars and that was for his last fight when he was defending his championship in Yankee Stadium against Archie Moore. But, you know, the endorsement possibilities. I mean, Rocky basically lived off of his name in mm -hmm. the thirteen years after he retired until he died in a plane crash in nineteen sixty nine. And, you know, at wherever he went, he didn't have to pick up a check. You know, everybody was willing to, you know, roll out the red carpet for the, the former champ. What's the most important thing um, people will want? What, what, what's the big motivator to read this book? What, what's, the, what's the experience that the reader will get? Well, I think the experience is to revisit a lost era in American history. You know, to revisit that era of the smoky arenas, you know, the, the blue collar workers punching the clocks in the factories and then going to the arena, you know, the swells at, at Madison Square Garden or Yankee Stadium, and then, you know, Broadway and Toots Shores and, you know, New York when it was, you know, New York, when there were a lot of working class people there and they'd ride the subways to the fights. And, and to me, to dig into that era was just really rich and colorful. And you know, a great example, you know, Rocky, the, the, you know, the man who inspired Rocky Balboa, uh, that movie. You know, here he is, he's penniless in New York, he has all these big dreams, um, he doesn't know if he's gonna make it, and he walks up and down Broadway with his friend from Brockton, just people watching. And one day he sees Willie Pep, the lightweight champion from uh, Hartford, and he follows him, you know, he's well dressed, he's got a beautiful woman on his arm, he just follows him for blocks and watches him buy the woman a flower and pin it to her lapel and then go into a fancy restaurant. And he dreams of having that life. And they go to the, the theaters and they, the showgirls all know their names coming out of the, you know, the back door. And, and then he eventually achieved that life. Your oratory on this reflects your writing skill. Every time, I haven't, uh, you may have, told, may have been able to tell, I have not yet had a chance to read the book, um, but, but I've read a couple of chapters. And your, I, I'm not a student of writing per se, but I remember writing, um, it's not even skill, style is more the, 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 what I'm looking for. I remember, and I can attach myself to a writer's style. And having read *Prince of Providence* and now this book, you have a you have a such a, a uh, 
subtle storytelling skill. Uh, I think it's reflected in how you're describing the book. But do you recognize that? People tell you about that? Because I, 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 it, it, it's like butter. It's really <laughs> easy to read your stuff. Well, it's thanks. not unsophisticated. It's just smooth. Well, the thing you have to do is you have to get out of the way and let the story, let the action unfold, like, and put the reader in the moment. And you know, some of the nice feedback I've gotten is that even though we know that Rocky was history's only unbeaten heavyweight champ, 49-0, and 0, we know he never loses a fight. But as you go through these fights and relive them, they're very dramatic. And people have told me it, how incredibly dramatic they are. And even though they know he's going to win in the end, they're not quite sure. Well, isn't that the case even with, um, even with championship movies and, and, and yeah. you know, retros, whether it's Chariots of Fire or, I mean, I mean there's you know, Hoosiers. I mean, sure. We all know what yeah. the end is. Sea biscuit. I but mean, how you get there and what you overcome to get and, to achieve and, that, and, and you're able to you're able to you're able to do that. The yeah. corruption part of this whole thing, though, again, yeah. is is your fascination. That's compelling as well because the subtitle is Rocky's fight for perfection in a crooked world, because he achieves this perfect record, but he has to navigate this very complicated, you know, backstory of the mafia's control of boxing, the mafia's control of his manager. And you know, if, if he's not, you know, part of his purse is just going to the mob, and he knows there's nothing he can do about that if he wants a shot at the title. And he resents it, um, but he has to go along to get along. And so it's just that tension is really interesting to me as well. Um, that no longer exists in the boxing industry? I don't think so. I mean, I, I'm not, a, I, I'm not a, honestly a student of the modern boxing game, but it's changed. It's not. It's not front and center in American life like it used to be. No. And when did it go away, Michael? It's a, it, the last big fight I went to was Leonard Duran in Montreal. Yeah. I, I, that, that, was, that was maybe the last big hype. I remember listening on my transistor radio because it was on my birthday. It was on my 10th birthday, yeah. March 8, 1971, the Ali Frazier first fight. Yeah. Um, and, and I mean, that had, the, that had the nation absolutely it did. paralyzed. I yeah. mean, just absolutely stuck. But after Leonard Duran, who else? Well, boxing was really dying. Um, Rocky was the last of an era. And then Muhammad Ali breathed new life into it because with his outsized personality and dramatics. Obviously, yeah. And, and then ever since then, I mean, there have been notable champions like Mike Tyson and Vander Holyfield, but it's, it's not what it used to be no. in the public eye. And, and to me, that was fascinating how Rocky had to deal with that. And also how fans, fans are very cynical. They know that the fights can be fixed. They know the mob is running gambling schemes, but they're still drawn to the arena and they're drawn to the spectacle. And they're also drawn, this is kind of a dark side, the dark underbelly, they're drawn to the, the risk of death in the ring. And chapter six, I talk about, a, to me, one of the most dramatic fights Rocky ever had. It's not his most famous fight by far. But he nearly kills a fighter named Carmine Vingo, who's kind of like a slightly younger version of Rocky, this really hard-hitting, young, fearless, undefeated Italian fighter from the Bronx. And they fight on December 30th, 1949, his, Rocky's first big fight in Madison Square Garden. And they're just slamming at each other like lightweights. And uh, finally, uh, Rocky knocks Vingo down. And it's the hardest Rocky's ever been hit. And then he knocks Vingo down in the sixth round, and, and Vingo falls into a coma and is in a coma in a hospital for a week. And uh, he eventually pulls out of it, but he never fights again. He's blind in one eye. He's got a permanent limp. And he struggles for the rest of his life. And he says, and he doesn't remember the fight. He says, I remember walking up the steps into the ring. Uh, I don't remember a thing about the fight, but I remember Rocky, he was a great man. Rocky helped pay his, his hospital bills. And some people wondered if Rocky would ever fight again, because what it does to your mind to, to kill someone in the ring is, is not something to be overlooked. Right. You got, is your whistle wet enough? The book, Unbeaten, Rocky Marciano by Mike Stanton. I gotta get Mike's take on, on media in Washington. Have to. Be right back. <laughs>
uh, book signing sites here are coming up in August for Michael uh, in Framingham, in East Providence, Holyoke, uh, Providence Work. We will post this on the website at foxprovidence.com. Of course, everything that we do here is, is on foxprovidence.com, so we'll make sure if you miss it um, uh, that you've got those, uh, those dates. Uh, you're not silent on Twitter and the like uh, <laughs> about, about this president. We only have a few minutes. The attack on the press is exasperating. Well, it's exasperating. Relenting. It's it's part of his it's part of his game plan. It's part of how he revs up the base, deflects legitimate questions. I mean, case in point, the other day, he bans the CNN reporter right. from the Rose Garden for That's doing right. her job, right. and then he he tries to twist the reality of what happened, and. Um, you know, she wanted. To, she asked him two question, burning questions of the day about his summit with Putin uh, being delayed and about the Michael Cohen tapes. She didn't raise her voice. Um, other witnesses attest to that, and yet they booted her out. And you know, the other thing. And that he's was, not unlikely, by the way, in that setting when he's with a dignitary, uh, to take the bait and answer questions. So right. to not do it is a missed opportunity, and actually not doing your job. Exactly. You know, but she so was the pool reporter. Yeah. That was her job. And there was an interesting case recently, and this has a, been a pet peeve of mine, Dan, where um, he'll abuse a reporter in a press conference, or um, you know, Sarah Sanders will, and then they'll go on to the next question, and the next reporter will just take the next question. And there was a press conference recently, I think, with Sarah Sanders where um, the reporter was asking a question, not getting it answered, and then Sarah Sanders just moved away from her, went to another reporter, and the other reporter said, well, I'm going to let that other reporter finish her question. And I've long advocated that I wish the press would just get up and walk out or, you know, keep asking the same question until it's answered. Yeah, you know what? It, it, that, you, you, you're going to come on the radio to talk about the book after I read it, give me a couple weeks, uh, and then we'll have a long-form conversation about that because, you know, media cooperation is is is... It's a deep conversation. It is. I, I it's think. not, it's the, not you know, that collusion simple. Amongst, as I uh, collusion, you know, cooperation or collusion amongst the media is always. It, that's a very delicate line. It, it requires it a really sophisticated thought process. But let me simplify it. Collusion is when you're colluding for something nefarious. Cooperation is when you're trying to achieve a greater good, asking legitimate questions of our public leaders to hold them accountable. And I'd like to see more of that. And, and the other thing that really kind of bothered me the other day, he goes before the VFW. And these are men who, and women who fought and gave their lives and sacrificed for our freedoms. And here he is insulting the First Amendment, you know, one of the things that many military they veterans fought have, have fought for. All and right. he's calling them enemies of the state. Yeah. <laughs> uh, the book is unbeaten. Uh, make sure you get it. Again, check the website for all the, uh, the book signing. Give a chance to... Shoot the breeze with Mike. It's an easy thing to do. Congratulations. Thank you. We'll man. see you on the radio soon. Last word when we come back. Stay with us. All righty. Coming up on the Monday program, we will have a post-game conversation with Neva Work College Professor Mark Genest. Uh, his own thoughts on global security as it pertains to the president's program on that, whether it makes sense or whether it's just see of the pants. So I hope you enjoy that. You have a great weekend. Thanks for watching. See you on the radio at 3 on WPRO Monday.